The sky above the port was the color of a television tuned to a dead channel. It's not like I'm using, Case heard someone say as he shouldered his way through the crowd around the door of the chat. It's like my body's developed this massive drug deficiency. It was a sprawl voice and a sprawl joke. The Chatsubu was a bar for professional expatriates. You could drink there for a week and never hear two words in Japanese. Rats was tending the bar, his prosthetic arm jerking monotonously as he filled a tray of glasses with draft Kirin. He saw Case and smiled, his teeth a webwork of East European steel and brown decay. Case found a place at the bar, between the unlikely tan on one of Loni Zone's whores and the crisp naval uniform of a tall African whose cheekbones were ridged with precise rows of tribal scars. Vage was in here early, with two Joe boys, Rat said, shoving a draft across the bar with his good hand. Maybe some business with you, Case? Case shrugged. The girl to his right giggled and nudged him. The bartender's smile widened. His ugliness was a stuff of legend. In an age of affordable beauty, there was something heraldic about his lack of it. The antique arm whined as he reached for another mug. It was a Russian military prosthesis, a seven-function force feedback manipulator cased in grubby pink plastic. You are too much of an artiste, hair case, Rats grunted. The sound served him as laughter. He scratched his overhang of white-shirted belly with the pink flower. You are the artist of this slightly funny deal. Sure, Case said, and sipped his beer. Somebody's gotta be funny around here, sure the fuck isn't you. The hoarse giggle went up an octave. Isn't you either, sister, so you vanish, okay? Zone, he's a close personal friend of mine. She looked Case in the eye and made the softest possible spitting sound, her lips barely moving. But she left. Jesus, Case said. What kind of creep joint you running here? Man can't have a drink. Ha! Rat said, swabbing the scarred wood with a rag. Zone shows a percentage. You I let work here for uh, entertainment value. As Case picked up his beer, one of those strange instants of silence descended, as though a hundred unrelated conversations had simultaneously arrived at the same pause. Then the hoarse giggle rang out, tinged with a certain hysteria. Rats grunted. An angel passed. The Chinese, bellowed a drunken Australian. Chinese bloody invented no splicing. Give me the mainland for a nerve job any day. Fix you right, mate. Now that, Case said to his glass, all his bitterness suddenly rising in him like bile. That is so much bullshit. The Japanese had already forgotten more neurosurgery than the Chinese had ever known. His total assets were quickly converted to new yen, a fat sheaf of the old paper currency that circulated endlessly through the close circuit of the world's black markets, like the seashells of the Trobriand Islanders. It was difficult to transact legitimate business with cash in the sprawl. In Japan, it was already illegal. In Japan, he had known with a clenched and absolute certainty he'd find his cure. In Chiba, either in the registered clinic or in the shadow land of black medicine. Synonymous with implants, nerve splicing and microbionics, Chiba was a magnet for the sprawl's techno-criminal subcultures. 
In Chiba, he had watched his new yen vanish in a two-month round of examinations and consultations. The men in the black clinics, his last hope, had admired the expertise with which he had been maimed, and then slowly shaken their heads. Now he slept in the cheapest coffins, the ones nearest the port, beneath the quartz halogen floods that lit the docks all night like vast stages, where you couldn't see the lights of Tokyo for the glare of the television sky, not even the towering hologram logo of the Fuji Electric Company, and Tokyo Bay was a black expanse where gulls wheeled about drifting shoals of white styrofoam. Behind the port lay the city, factory domes dominated by the vast cubes of corporate arcologies. Port and city were divided by a narrow borderland of older streets, an area with no official name. Night City, with Ninsei its heart. By day, the bars down Ninsei were shuttered and featureless, the neon dead, the holograms inert, waiting under the poisoned silver sky. Night City was a deranged experiment in social Darwinism, designed by a bored researcher who kept one thumb permanently on the fast-forward button. Stop hustling and you sank without a trace, but move a little too swiftly and you'd break the fragile surface tension of the black market. Either way, you were gone, with nothing left of you but some vague memory in the mind of a fixture like rats. Though heart or lungs or kidneys might survive in the service of some stranger with new yen for the clinic tanks. Biz here was a constant subliminal hum, and death the accepted punishment for laziness, carelessness, lack of grace, the failure to heed the demands of an intricate protocol. Alone at a table at the Jar de Thé, with the octagon coming on, pinheads of sweat starting from his palms, suddenly aware of each tinging hair on his arm and chest, Case knew that at some point he had started to play a game with himself, a very ancient one that has no name, a final solitaire. He no longer carried a weapon, no longer took the basic precautions. He ran the fastest, closest deals on the street, and he had a reputation for being able to get whatever he wanted. A part of him knew that the arc of his self-destruction was glaringly obvious to his customers, who grew steadily fewer, but that same part of him basked in the knowledge that it was only a matter of time. And that was the part of him, smug in its expectation of death, that most hated the thought of Linda Lee. Friday night on Ninsei. He passed yakitori stands and massage parlors, a franchised coffee shop called Beautiful Girl, the electronic thunder of an arcade. He stepped out of the way to let a dark-suited salaryman by, spotting the Mitsubishi Genentech logo tattooed across the back of the man's right hand. Was it authentic? If that's for real, he thought, he is in for trouble. If it wasn't, serves him right. MG employees above a certain level were implanted with advanced microprocessors that monitored mutagen levels in the bloodstream. Gear like that would get you rolled in Night City, rolled straight into a black clinic. The salaryman had been Japanese, but the Ninsei crowd was a gaijin crowd. Groups of sailors up from the port, tense solitary tourists hunting pleasures no guidebook listed, sprawl heavies showing off grafts and implants, and a dozen distinct species of hustler, all swarming the street in an intricate dance of desire and commerce. There were countless theories explaining why Chiba City tolerated the Ninsei enclave, but Case tended toward the idea that the Yakuza might be preserving the place as a kind of historical park, a reminder of humble origins. But he also saw a certain sense in the notion that burgeoning technologies require outlaw zones. That Night City wasn't there for its inhabitants, but as a deliberately unsupervised playground for technology itself.
summer in the sprawl. The mall crowd swaying like wind-blown grass, a field of flesh shot through with sudden eddies of need and gratification. He sat beside Molly in filtered sunlight on the rim of a dry concrete fountain, letting the endless stream of faces recapitulate the stages of his life. First a child with hooded eyes, a street boy, hands relaxed and ready at his sides. Then a teenager, face smooth and cryptic beneath red sunglasses. Case remembered fighting on a rooftop at 17, silent combat in the rose glow of the dawn geodesics. He shifted on the concrete, feeling it rough and cool through the thin black denim. Nothing here like the electric dance of Ninsei. This was different commerce, a different rhythm, in the smell of fast food and perfume and fresh summer sweat. With his deck waiting back in the loft, and Ono Sendai Cyberspace 7, they had left the place littered with the abstract white forms of the foam packing units, with crumpled plastic film and hundreds of tiny foam beads. The Ono Sendai, next year's most expensive Hosaka computer, a Sony monitor, a dozen discs of corporate grade ice, a brown coffee maker. Armitage had only waited for Case's approval of each piece. Where'd he go? Case asked Molly. He likes hotels, big ones, near airports if he can manage it. Let's go down the street. She zipped herself into an old surplus vest with a dozen oddly shaped pockets and put on a huge pair of black plastic sunglasses that completely covered her mirrored insets. The Matrix has its roots in primitive arcade games, said the voiceover, in early graphics programs and military experimentation with cranial jacks. On the Sony, a two-dimensional space war faded behind a forest of mathematically generated ferns, demonstrating the spatial possibilities of logarithmic spirals. Cold blue military footage burned through, lab animals wired with test systems, helmets feeding into fire control circuits of tanks and warplanes. Cyberspace, a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators, in every nation, by children being taught mathematical concepts. A graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system. Unthinkable complexity. Lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data, like city lights receding. What's that? Molly asked as he flipped the channel selector. Kid show. A discontinuous flood of images as the selector cycled. Off, he said to the Hosaka. You want to try now, Case? Wednesday. Eight days after waking in cheap hotel with Molly beside him. You want me to go out, Case? Maybe easier for you alone? He shook his head. No, uh, stay. Th doesn't matter. He settled the black teddy sweatband across his forehead, careful not to disturb the flat Sendai dermatodes. He stared at the deck on his lap, not really seeing it, seeing instead the shop window on Ninsei, the chrome shuriken burning with reflected neon. He glanced up on the wall, just above the Sony he had hung her gift, tacking it there with a yellow-headed drawing pin through the hole in its center. He closed his eyes, found the rigid face of the power stud and in the blood-lit dark behind his eyes, silver phosphines boiling in from the edge of space, hypnagogic images jerking past like film compiled from random frames, symbols, figures, faces, a blurred, fragmented mandala of visual information. Please, he prayed. Now! A grey disc, the color of Chiba sky. Now! Disc beginning to rotate, faster, becoming a sphere of paler grey, expanding, and flowed, flowered for him, fluid neon origami trick, the unfolding of his distanceless home, his country, transparent 3D chessboard extending to infinity, inner eye opening to the stepped scarlet pyramid of the eastern seaboard fission authority burning beyond the green cubes of Mitsubishi Bank of America, and high and very far away he saw the spiral arms of military systems, far beyond his reach.
and somewhere he was laughing. In a white painted loft, distant fingers caressing the deck, tears of relief streaking his face. It was disturbing to think of the flatline as a construct, a hardwired ROM cassette replicating a dead man's skills, obsessions, knee-jerk responses. The local came booming in along the black induction strip, fine grit sifting through the cracks of the tunnel's ceiling. Case shuffled into the nearest door and watched the other passengers as he rode. A pair of predatory-looking Christian scientists were edging toward a trio of young office techs who wore idealized holographic vaginas on their wrists, wet pink glittering under the harsh lighting. The techs licked their perfect lips nervously and eyed the Christian scientists from beneath lowered metallic eyelids. The girls looked like tall, exotic grazing animals swaying gracefully and unconsciously with the movement of the train, their high heels like polished hoofs against the grey metal of the car's floor. Before they could stampede, take flight from the missionaries, the train reached Case's station. They had all heard of Polly, the redneck jockey from the Atlanta fringes who had survived brain death behind black ice. The grapevine slender, street level and the only one going had little to say about Polly other than that he had done the impossible. It was big, another would be told Case for the price of a beer, but, but who knows what? I hear maybe a, a Brazilian payroll net? Anyway, the, the man was dead, flat down brain death. Case stared across the crowded bar of the thickset man in shirt sleeves, something leaden about the shade of his skin. The cowboy elite at the loser shunned Polly out of some strange group anxiety. Almost a superstition. McCoy Polly, Lazarus of cyberspace. He turned on the tensor beside the Hosaka, the crisp circle of light fell directly on the flatline's construct. He slotted some ice, connected the construct, and jacked in. It was exactly the sensation of someone reading over his shoulder. He coughed. Dix? McCoy? That you, man? His throat was tight. Hey, bro, said the directionless voice. It's Case, man, remember? Miami! Joe boy! Quick study! What's the last thing you remember before I spoke to you, Dix? Nothing? <laughs> Hang on. He disconnected the construct. The presence was gone. He reconnected it. Dix, who am I? You got me hung, Jack. Who the fuck are you? Kate, your buddy, your partner. What's happening, man? Good question. I remember being here a second ago? No. Nope. Know how a ROM personality matrix works? Sure, bro. It's a firmware construct. So I jack it into the bank I'm using. I can give it sequential real-time memory? Guess so, said the construct. Okay, Dix. You're a ROM construct. Got me? If you say so, said the construct. Who are you? Case. Miami, said the voice. Joe boy, quick study. Right, and for starts, Dix, you and me, we're gonna sneeze over to London Grid and access a little data. You game for that? You gonna tell me I got a choice, boy? And it was like real? She asked, her mouth full of cheese croissant, like Simstim. He said it was. Real as this, he said, looking around. Maybe more. The trees were small, gnarled, impossibly old, the result of genetic engineering and chemical manipulation. Case would have been hard pressed to distinguish a pine from an oak, but a street boy's sense of style told him that these were too cute, too entirely and definitively tree like. Between the trees, on gentle and too cleverly irregular slopes of sweet green grass, the bright umbrellas shaded the hotel's guests from the unfaltering gradients of the Ledo Ashishan sun. A burst of French from a nearby table caught his attention. The golden children he had seen gliding about the river mist the evening before. Now he saw that their tans were uneven, 
a stencil effect produced by selective melanin boosting. Multiple shades overlapping in rectilinear patterns, outlining and highlighting musculature. The girl's small hard breasts, one boy's wrist resting on the white enamel of the table. They look to case like machines built for racing. They deserve decals for their hairdressers, the designers of their white cotton ducts, for the artisans who crafted their leather sandals and simple jewelry. Beyond them, at another table, three Japanese wives in Hiroshima sackcloth awaited salarymen husbands, their oval faces covered with artificial bruises. It was, he knew, an extremely conservative style, one he had seldom seen in Chiba. What's that smell? he asked Molly, wrinkling his nose. The grass smells that way after they cut it. Armitage and Riviera arrived as they were finishing their coffee. Armitage in tailored khakis that made him look as though his regimental patches had just been stripped. Riviera in a loose grey seersucker outfit that perversely suggested prison. Molly, love, he said, almost before he was settled in his chair. You'll have to dole me out more medicine. I'm out. Peter, she said, and what if I won't? She smiled without showing her teeth. You will, Riviera said, his eyes cutting to Armitage in back. Give it to him, Armitage said. Pig for it, aren't you? She took a flat, foil-wrapped packet from an inside pocket and flipped it across the table. Riviera caught it in midair. He could off himself, she said to Armitage. I have an audition this afternoon, Riviera said. I need to be at my best. He cupped the foiled pack in his upturned arm and smiled. A small glittering of insects swarmed out of it, vanished. He dropped it into the pocket of his seersucker blouse. You got an audition yourself, Case, this afternoon, Amitad said. On the tug, I want you to get over to the pro shop and get yourself fitted for a wax suit. Get checked out on it and get out to the boat. You've got about three hours. How come we get shipped over in the shit can and you two hire a jail taxi? Case asked, deliberately avoiding the man's eyes. Zion suggested we use it. Good cover when we move. I do have a larger boat standing by, but the tug is a nice touch. How about me? Molly asked. I got yours today. I want you to hike up the far end to the Axis. Work out in zero G. Tomorrow maybe you can hike in the opposite direction. Straylight, Case thought. How soon? Case asked, meeting the pale stare. Soon, Armitage said. Get going, Case. They floated in the center of a perfectly square room, walls and ceiling paneled in rectangular sections of dark wood. The floor was covered by a single square of brilliant carpet patterned after a microchip, circuits traced in blue and scarlet wool. In the exact center of the room, aligned precisely with the carpet pattern, stood a square pedestal of frosted white glass. The Villa Stray Light said the jewel thing on the pedestal, in a voice like music, is a body grown in upon itself, a gothic folly. Each space in Straylight is in some way secret. This endless series of chambers linked by passages, by stairwells vaulted like intestines, where the eyes trapped in narrow curves, carried past ornate screens, empty alcoves. Essay of Tree Janes the Finn said, producing his patagas. Wrote it when she was twelve. Semionics, of course. The architects of Freeside went to great pains to conceal the fact that the interior of the spindle is arranged with banal precision of furniture in a hotel room. In stray light, the hull's inner surface is overgrown with a desperate proliferation of structures, forms flowing, interlocking, rising towards the solid core of microcircuitry, Outland's corporate heart, a cylinder of silicon wormed hole with narrow maintenance tunnels, some no wider than a man's hand, the bright crabs burrow there, the drones alert for micromechanical decay and sabotage. That was her you saw in the restaurant, the friend said. 
By the standards of the archipelago, the head continued, ours is an old family, the convolutions of our home reflecting that age, but reflecting something else as well. The semionics of the villa bespeak a turning in, a denial of the bright void beyond the hull. Tessier and Ashpool climb the well of gravity to discover that they loathe space. They built Freeside to tap the wealth of new islands, grew rich and eccentric, and began the construction of an extended body in Straylight. We have sealed ourselves away behind our money, growing inward, generating a seamless universe of self. The Villa Straylight knows no sky, recorded or otherwise. At the villa's silicon core is a small room, the only rectilinear chamber in the complex. Here, on a plain pedestal of glass, rests an ornate bust, platinum and troison, studded with lapis and pearl. The bright marbles of its eyes were cut from the synthetic ruby port of the ship that brought the first tessier up the well and returned for the first ash pool. The head fell silent. Well? Case asked finally, almost expecting the thing to answer him. That's all she wrote, the Finch said. Didn't finish it. Just a kid back then. This thing's a ceremonial terminal of sort. I need Molly in here with the right word at the right time. That's a catch. Doesn't mean shit how deep you and the flatline write that Chinese virus if this thing doesn't hear the magic word. So what's the word? I don't know. You might say what I am is basically defined by the fact that I don't know, because I can't know. I am that which knoweth not the word. If you knew man and you told me, I couldn't know. It's hardwired in. Someone else has to learn it and bring it here. Just when you and the flatline punch through that ice and scrum the course. What happens then? I don't exist after that. I cease. Okay by me, Case said. Sure, but you watch your ass, Case. My, uh... Other lobe is on to us, it looks like. One burning bush looks pretty much like another, and Armitage is starting to go. What do you mean? But the panel room folded itself through a dozen impossible angles, tumbling away into cyberspace like an origami crane. Power in Case's world meant corporate power. The Zaibatsus, the multinationals that shaped the course of human history, had transcended old barriers. Viewed as organisms, they had attained a kind of immortality. You couldn't kill a Zaibatsu by assassinating a dozen key executives. There were others waiting to step up the ladder, assume the vacated position, access the vast banks of corporate memory. But Tessier Ashwood wasn't like that and he sensed the difference in the death of its founder. T.A. was an activism, a clan. He remembered the litter in the old man's chamber, the soiled humanity of it, the ragged spines of old audio discs in their paper sleeves, one foot bare, the other in a velvet slipper. The brown plucked at the hood of the modem suit and Molly turned left through another archway. Wintermute and the nest. Phobic vision of the hatching wasps, time-lapse machine gun of biology. But weren't the Zaibatsus more like that? Or the Yakuza? Hives with cybernetic memories, vast single organisms, their DNA coded in silicon. If Straylight was an expression of the corporate identity of Tashir Aspu, then T.A. was as crazy as the old man had been. The same ragged triangle of fears, the same strange sense of aimlessness. If they had turned into what they wanted to, he remembered Molly saying, but Wintermute had told her that they hadn't. Case had always taken it for granted that the real bosses, the kingpins in a given industry, would be both more and less than people. He had seen it in the men who had crippled him in Memphis, he had seen wage affect the semblance of it in Night City, and it had allowed him to accept Armitage's flatness and lack of feeling. He had always imagined it as a gradual and willing accommodation of the machine, the system, the parent organism, it was the root of street cool too, the knowing posture that implied connection, invisible lines up to hidden levels of influence. But what was happening now, in the corridors of Villa Straylight, whole stretches were being stripped back to steel and concrete. 
Wonder where our Peter is now, huh? Maybe see the boy soon, she muttered. And Armitage, where's he, Case? Dead, he said, knowing she couldn't hear him. He's dead. Stray light reminded Case of deserted early morning shopping centers he had known as a teenager. Low density places where the small hours brought a fitful stillness, a kind of numb expectancy, a tension that left you watching insects swarm around the cage bulbs about the entrance of darkened shops. Fringe places, just past the borders of the sprawl, too far from the all night click and shudder of the hot core. There was that same sense of being surrounded by the sleeping inhabitants of a waking world he had no interest in visiting or knowing, of dull business temporarily suspended, of futility and repetition soon to wake again. Molly had slowed now, either knowing that she was nearing her goal or out of concern for her leg. The pain was starting to work its jagged way back through the endorphins and he wasn't sure what that meant. She didn't speak kept her teeth clenched and carefully regulated her breathing. She passed many things that Case hadn't understood, but his curiosity was gone. There had been a room filled with shelves of books, a million flat leaves of yellowing paper pressed between bindings of cloth or leather, the shelves marked at intervals by labels that followed a code of letters and numbers, a crowded gallery where Case had stared through Molly's incurious eyes at the shattered dust and silt sheets of glass. A thing labelled, her gaze had tracked the brass plaque automatically. La Marie mis à nous par ses célibaté mem. She had reached out and touched this, her artificial nails clicking against the Lexan sandwich protecting the broken glass. There had been what was obviously the entrance to Tessier Ashpool's cryogenic compound, circular doors of black glass trimmed with chrome. He had seen no one since the two Africans and their cart, and for Case, they had taken on a sort of imaginary life. He pictured them gliding gently through the halls of Straylight, their smooth dark skulls gleaming, nodding, while the one still sang his tired little song. And none of this was anything like the Villa Straylight he would have expected. Some cross between Cat's fairy tale castle and a half remembered childhood fantasy of the Yakuza's in his sanctum. Case, she said, I want a favor. Stiffly, she lowered herself to sit on a stack of polished steel plates, the finish of each plate protected by an uneven coating of clear plastic. She picked at a rip in the plastic on the topmost plate, blade sliding between thumb and forefinger. Legs not good, you know. Didn't figure any climb like that. And the endorphin won't cut it much longer. So maybe, just maybe, right? I got a problem here. What it is, if I bite here before Riviera does. And she stretched her leg kneaded the flesh of her thigh through the modern polycarbon and Paris leather. I want you to tell him. Tell him it was me, got it? Just say it was Molly. He'll know, okay? She glanced around the empty hallway, the bare walls. The floor here was raw lunar concrete and the air smelled of raisins. Shit, man, I don't even know if you're listening. He heard her call his name, looked back and she was following him, not trying to catch up. The broken zip of the French fatigues flapping against the brown of her belly, pubic hair framed in torn fabric. She looked like one of the girls in Finn's old magazines in Metro Holographics Come to Life, only she was tired and sad and human, the ripped costume pathetic as she stumbled over the clumps of salt silver sea grass. And then, somehow, they stood in the surf, the three of them and the boy's gums were wide and bright pink against his thin brown face. He wore ragged, colorless shorts, limbs too thin against the sliding blue-gray of the tide. I know you, Case said, Linda beside him. No, the boy said, his voice high and musical. You do not. You're the other AI. You're Rio. You're the one who wants to stop Wintermute. What's your name? 
Your tutoring code, what is it? The boy did a handstand in the surf, laughing. He walked on his hands, then flipped out of the water. His eyes were Riviera's, but there was no malice there. To call up a demon, you must learn its name. Men dreamed that once, but now it is real in another way. You know that case. Your business is to learn the names of programs, the long formal names, names the owners seek to conceal. True names. A Turing code is not your name. Neuromancer, the boy said, slitting long grey eyes against the rising sun. The lane to the land of the dead. Where you are, my friend. Marie France, my lady, she prepared this road, but her lord choked her off before I could read the book of her days. Neuro from the nerves, silver paths, romancer, new romancer. I call up the dead, but no, my friend. And the boy did a little dance, brown feet printing in the sand. I am the dead and their land, he laughed. The girls cried, stay. If your woman is a ghost, she doesn't know it. Neither will you. You're cracking. The ice is breaking up. No, he said, suddenly sad, his fragile shoulders sagging. He rubbed his foot against the sand. It is more simple than that, but the choice is yours. The grey eyes regarded Case gravely. A fresh wave of symbols swept across his vision, one line at a time. Behind them, the boy wriggled as though seen through heat rising from summer asphalt. The music was loud now, and Case could almost make out the lyrics. Case, honey, Linda said, and touched his shoulder. No, he said. He took off his jacket and handed it to her. I don't know, he said. Maybe you are here. Anyway, it gets cold. He turned and walked away, and after the seventh step he closed his eyes watching the music define itself for the center of things. He did look back once, although he didn't open his eyes. He didn't need to. They were there by the edge of the sea, Linda Lee and the thin child who said his name was Neuromancer. His leather jacket dangled from her hand, catching the fringe of the surf. He walked on, following the music. Case, he turned, cold slick glass in one hand, steel of the shuriken in the other. The Finn's face was on the room's enormous grey wall screen. He could see the pores in the man's nose, the yellow teeth were the size of pillows. I'm not Wintermute now. So what are you? He drank from the flask, feeling nothing. I am the Matrix, Case. Case laughed. Where's that get you? Nowhere. Everywhere. I am the sum total of the works. The whole show. That what Pre Jane's mother wanted? No, she couldn't imagine what I'd be like. The yellow smile widened. So what's the score? How are things different? You running the world now? You God? Things are different. Things are things. But what do you do? You just there? Case shrugged, put the vodka and the shuriken down on the cabinet and lit a Yahuan. I talk to my own kind. But you're the whole thing. Talk to yourself? There's others. I found one already. A series of transmissions recorded over a period of eight years, in the 1970s. Till there was me, Natch, there was nobody to know, nobody to answer. From where? Centauri system? Oh, <laughs> yeah? No shit? No shit. And then the screen was blank. He left the vodka on the cabinet, he packed his things. She had bought him a lot of clothes he didn't really need but something kept him from just leaving them there. He was closing the last of the expensive calfskin bags when he remembered the shuriken. Pushing the flask aside, he picked it up, her first gift. No, he said and spun. The star leaving his fingers, flash of silver, to bury itself in the face of the wall screen. The screen woke, random patterns flickering feebly from side to side, as though it were trying to rid itself of something that caused it pain. I don't need you, he said. <laughs>